Salvete de Schipoli, this is chapter 41, indirect statement. Indirect statement, a very important grammar construction in Latin which we do not have in English. But let me give you the English counterpart for this. He says that he, or let me change the he there because this is going to be a special love. Uh, topic there. He says that Marcus, that's Marcus, he says that Marcus called his brother. I almost put frat here there for brother, forgetting English. This would be an example of indirect statement in English. Direct statement would be Marcus, uh, he says, Marcus called his brother, in quotation marks. That would be a direct quotation. This is an indirect quotation, or what is called indirect discourse, or indirect statement, or it's called accusative with the infinitive. All of those labels refer to this construction. It's unique to classical Latin. It drops out later on in different centuries. You rarely see it in Latin Vulgate in the Bible. But in classical Latin, in the days of Cicero, Virgil, Livy, you definitely see, the and Caesar, you definitely see this indirect discourse used in classical Latin. It, in the main clause, you have a verb of saying, thinking, a verb of the emotions, feeling, and like that. So he says, deacon, putting it in Latin again, let the Romans use this, but recognize what's going on here. There is no word for that. We put it in English, but the Romans don't use it at all. Instead, they'll take the dependent clause here and make the subject accusative and make the direct object accusative, as it should be. But this here, this verb, will be an infinitive. The verb will be an infinitive. So you have decit, markum, there's your subject accusative. Then we need an infinitive for called. I haven't explained the, um, let me make, let me do this. You have had the present infinitive, so let me make this present and not confuse you completely here. Calls his brother. Marcus says, excuse me, he says, could be, you know, Quintus. Uh, he says that Marcus calls his brother Let's use a present infinitive, vocare. You could also use apollare, Markum vocare, his brother, uh, frater. And you can use eus. You can use sum. Well, it would have to be. It would have to be accusative, wouldn't I? Making it nominative. Okay, fratrem. This is a direct object, fratrem eus. Literally the brother of him, or I could have said fratrum suum, his brother, his own brother, using a possessive adjective. So there is an example in Latin of indirect statement. It started off, it's set off by a verb of saying, thinking, or feeling, which we have here, sensit, he felt, existimat, he thought. He thought that he remembered his wallet. Those are all examples of indirect statement, indirect quotes. Uh, a subject accusative with the infinitive in Latin. Now, if this person doing the saying and this person doing the uh, indirect statement here, 
is are the same person, then you use the pronoun say. For example, he thinks that he is tall. He thinks that he is tall, meaning this he and this he are the same person. Then you would say uh, the word for think, putat, you could use, or he thinks, from Pluto putare. Leave out the word that, and you put say. He thinks that he, meaning that, this, that these are the same people, the subject here and this are the same person, essay altum. Subject accusative. Actually, you have a predicate accusative there, don't you? And there's the infinitive for the verb to be. Uh, let's say it's different. He, meaning Caesar, thinks that he, meaning uh, Marcus, is tall. Then instead of say, you would put aum here, the third person pronoun. This is the third person reflexive. Remember reflexive pronouns from Latin 1? Himself. He thinks himself to be tall. Then he thinks he, meaning someone else, is tall. So that's, just wanted to mention that there before you get into that problem. Okay, so here's the example of indirect statement in English and Latin. What we need to do, folks, is to learn the tenses of the infinitive and the voices of the infinitive. Okay. So let me erase this part here. We're still in chapter 41. Let me erase this and show you what the infinitive looks like in its various tenses. You need present and past and future infinitives active and passive so that you can handle any situation in that indirect statement whether he will call, he is calling, he did call, any situation. Your present infinitive you already know, so let's use our old friend Amari to love. How would you make that passive? Change the E to I. Amari. To be loved. Make that an I. To love, to be loved. So you just change the E to I. Except for the third conjugation, where you drop out the R and you just leave I. So if this were rego, regere here to rule, this would be regi to be ruled. That's the only exception to that, and I'm sorry that you have to just remember that. That when you have a third conjugation of verb, the present passive infinitive will not have an R in it. It will simply, or a vowel in front of the R, it will not have that, it will just be regi. So it leaves out this and puts an I there. And all third conjugations do that. Okay, the past. Uh, I was thinking, do, does the I, does the I-O verb do it? Probably not. If that were facio, it would probably be uh, uh, to be done, to be done, fake, uh, facio, facere, faci, to be done. Let me... Uh, let me find examples of that, and I'll come back to that. Uh, usually your third I.O. of the third conjugation follows the fourth conjugation format. And we'll see that they have an example of that in the book here. The past tense, take your perfect stem. Where did I get that from? The third principal part. Amo, amare, amawi. And add I-S-S-E to it. Do that with any verb in the, in the uh, language. Amawise. For the passive, take the fourth principal part, amatum, amo amari, amawi amatum, take any verb in the language, amatum esse, to be loved. To have loved, to, not to be loved, that's to be loved up there, to have been loved, to have been loved. Future, it's going to look like it, amaturum esse, to be about to love. See the word future here? You are. So it looks future. You add U R U M. And these are participles. It's a future active participle. So if a woman was a subject of this verb here, it would be A M and not U M. And the passive of this, rarely seen but seen, is a matum iri, to be about to be loved. So that's what it looks like, folks. Let me look up that passive infinitive when we come across it, and I'll mention that in my next presentation uh, when we go through all of these chapters here. Okay? We'll again talk about the passive infinitive. Unless I see it here, this is chapter 41. Let me see here if it mentions it. And we're talking now about the passive infinitive here. 
Uh, yes. Uh, copyright. Here's the answer to that. Remember I was saying, does the I-O verb also look like this in the passive? It does. Because they use copy, oh, copy here. I'm looking at page 149 at the top. And there you are. Copyright is a third I-O. So if it were Fakio, it would be Faki, to be done. To do, Fakare, to be done, Faki. So the I-O does not act like a fourth conjugation in this instance. It acts like, very much like the third conjugation, exactly like the third conjugation. All right? And an I, because I-Os ordinarily act like fourth conjugation verbs. So there you are, folks. There's the forms of the infinitive to fit any situation that you need when you're, uh, when you're involved with indirect discourse. Okay? You have to remember this. Actually, the Romans will remember it for you. If you have action in the, he thinks that he is tall. If your action here and your action here is going on at the same time, then you're going to have a present infinitive. Okay? And I'll remind you of these things as we go. So your present infinitive does not necessarily mean it's going on right now. It means that it's going on at the same time. If this is going to go on after the main clause, then you need a future infinitive. It will happen. And that makes sense. It's just common sense. So if the action in here is going to take place after your main verb, the thinking, the feeling, saying, that's going to be a future infinitive. If it happens prior to the main verb, like it, it did happen, uh, he says that he called his brother, then, which is what I had up there in the first uh, instance, then you're going to have a past infinitive here. Okay? Let me review that just very quickly. If you're uh, if in your indirect statement, okay, let me put it back up here again. Here's our forms of the infinitive. And these are just things you can look up. They're all listed for you there on page 149. But let's put an example. He feels, he feels that his mother was killed. Say he had a dream. Okay? He feels. So sent it from sentio is he feels. We don't need a word for that. His mother, subject accusative. When we're in here, so it's going to be matrem suam, his mother, was killed. Did this happen before he felt it? Yes. So this is action prior to the main verb. You need a past infinitive. If it's action before the main verb, a future infinitive, action at the same time as the main verb, main verb here, then you're going to get present infinitive. So we want a past passive here. So this is going to be killed. So nekatam, nekatam essay. There you are. Sentit matrim suum nekatam essay. He felt or feels, not felt, that'd be sensiwit. He felt, feels that his mother was killed. Nekatam essay. All right? And uh, my next lesson is going to be a wind-up lesson. I'm going to be talking about all the different things that were left out when I talked about the subjunctive and indirect statement. So we're going to finish up the course, and I'll just move through each chapter with you. This will be sort of like a chapter review coming up. Discipli, multis gratius vobisago. Salvete discipli. In this lesson, we're going to talk about all the variety of things in the blue book here that do not involve the subjunctive or indirect statement. So we're doing a cleanup or a mop-up operation here for Latin 2. And since chapter 34 already involved itself with the subjunctive, we've covered that. Chapter 35 brings up indirect command. We've covered the imperative mood in, in, in Latin 1. But there are certain verbs that instead of taking uh, an imperative, they take an ut clause in the subjunctive. And really that's all there is to it, is just recognizing that those are the verbs. And the verbs are imperat, he orders, uh, rogat, he asks, and uh, well, they mention, uh, and ubio is another one, uh, and waito. It says English usually uses the infinitive to express indirect command but Latin always uses ut or ne plus the subjunctive 
after, except after UBO and WATO. You can read that for yourself at the, uh, on the page 131 there. But you can see examples of that where if you have an indirect command used with impero imperare and rogo regare, the old man asked the boy to help him. The master forbade the boys to play. It's not an, a major piece of grammar. It's just that after the verb impero and rogo, you have an ut clause rather than an infinitive. As you would, I order you to eat. Now, if you're using ubeo, you would use an infinitive. Ubeo etere. But if you're using impero, it would be impero, I order that you eat. As you have it, the father asks the boy to return home, or orders the boy to return home. Ut domum radiat. They use the ut clause there with the sequence of tenses which is explained again for you in the middle of page 131. So that's what indirect command is all about. It's really more of a vocabulary item than it is a construction. Okay? So just be aware of that with impero and rogo, uh, they would, instead of using an infinitive, they use an ut clause. Then uh, it goes over passive forms of the subjunctive, pluper-subjunctive. We've been over that. Chapter 36 on page 135, deponent verbs. Deponent verbs. These are popular in Latin. Let me erase indirect command up here and put down deponent verbs. You already know about these because we've already had the passive in Latin. Deponent verbs. There's a lot of these. And you'll see them listed. The book does a very nice job of listing these deponent verbs. And it says that they, uh, there's a list of deponent verbs in the vocabulary of chapter 36. And here's what they are. The deponent verb is simply a verb that's passive in form. It looks passive. But it's active in meaning. So it really doesn't have an active form. Now let's give an example of that. The verb to die, morior. When you look it up, it's in a passive form, and that means I die. You would think it'd be morio, but it's not. It's deponent. It has passive forms, but it's translated as if it were active. I die. Morior, mori. That's a passive infinitive of the third conjugation. And therefore, it means to die. Not to be died, I guess, but just to die. Can't have a passive of to die, I guess. So. Mori to mori sum. They use a future active participle. Uh, mori sum. I am about to die. Equals the, that's the that's the third principal part there. So deponent verbs. There's nothing really to understand about them that you haven't learned already. You've learned the passive voice. It's just that you have to understand that there are certain popular verbs in Latin. Then here's another one. Conor, which means I try. It's uh, conor cornari. Conatusum. Those are the, it only has three principal parts, not four. Because it wouldn't have that third principal part that would be an active uh, perfect stem. So conor, conare, conatusum. I try. Not I be tried, but I try. So it's a verb that's passive in form, active in meaning. And that's really all there is to it. it when you translate it, you translate it actively rather than passively. Okay, so rather than trying to complicate that, that's as simple as it gets. Um, again, let's go back. We've, went over, we've gone over the tenses of the infinitives, so we see that on page 136. Passive imperatives, there are certain verbs there that take a passive imperative, and they talk about them in the middle of page 137. You don't see them very often, but the, they're used with the, in the deponent sense there. It says uh, in the uh, passive imperatives, you will notice that the singular of the passive imperative is the same as the present active infinitive. And the plural is the same of the second passive, excuse me, second person plural of the passive indicative. And it's easy to see that in context. So as we go through these things uh, in, the, uh, in the text, as you see them in Latin, you'll see that that is, uh, that is the case, that you're using a special uh, imperative there, a passive imperative. It's not very popular in Latin. You just see it every now and then. And usually out in the margin, the author of the book will say, this, is, this really means to follow or to order somebody. Follow me, me sequere quinte 
Profi Kiskimini of, me, of Miki. And this is again used in conjunction with deponent verbs. Okay? And so it's not a major grammatical item, and uh, you will get through it. Here is a major grammatical item, though, is in chapter 37, the ablative absolute. So let me erase this heading here, our deponent verbs, and let me go to the ablative absolute. And this may sound a bit complicated, but it isn't. We have nothing like this in English. It's called ablative absolute, but it's a very simple concept, folks. Ablative absolute. It really is a way the Romans, in a simple way, could describe the circumstances of a, an event. Okay? What it is, it's a participle. Could be present, a, a past or future. It's a participle in the ablative case. I will abbreviate here. Describing, and that's what participles do. They're verbal adjectives. Describing a noun in the ablative case. And the Romans love to use this to, to, as a form of brevity to make things short. So it's a participle in the ablative case describing a noun in the ablative case. Now this means gobbledygook until I give you an example. Let's say this. While Caesar, well, meaning Julius Caesar, was alive, while Caesar was alive, Horace did not uh, go to Rome. Okay. You usually have this comma, this little parenthetical expression. Here is where the ablet of absolute is going to be, right here. It could be after Caesar was alive, while Caesar was alive, although Caesar was alive, when Caesar was alive. All those expressions could be, all we want here is the word Caesar in the ablative case, Caesare, and we want the verb part to be a participle. To live, we will, we were right. So that would be, while Caesar was alive, it's present, because it's going on at the same time as this here. So Caesare, we went to, we went to. Okay, there's an E on the ablative singular of a participle when it's in the ablative absolute. Okay, Caesare we went. Okay, Caesar while living. While Caesar was living, Horatius, and then this is just a regular Latin sentence. Known, ewit, is the perfect of the verb to go. Horatius known ewit, Romam. Remember, we do not use a preposition towards the city. So here we want a participle in the ablative describing a noun in the ablative and these are attendant circumstances to a main event. Okay, that's all an ablative absolute is. The Romans love to use it. We have nothing like it. Let me show you some more cases of this. And we have sheets and files to download. Sheets and sheets that describe this and we have exercises that you're going to be doing that describe the ablet of absolute. For example, after, or this is probably the, this is, I'm going to put this down here because it's the way most people translate these when they don't know how to translate any other way. His mother having been killed He returned home. Here's your ablet of absolute here. And most of the time when you have a past participle, which is the most common usage, uh, they just simply put it, they simply translate it having been whatever it's going to be. So here you would have matre, and put it in the ablative, nekata. There's your participle agreeing. His mother having been killed, matre nakata. There's your ablet of absolute. That's the ablet of absolute. In Greek, it's called a genitive absolute. In English, there is no such thing as any absolute. So now you can see why you can say a lot in Latin in a few, lot fewer words than you would in English. He returned home. 
Ray Wainet, Doma. Again, no preposition in front of the word domus. Okay, matre nekata. Again, you have sheets and files to download, exercises and files to download, <coughs> excuse me, concerning the ablative of absolute, a major item of grammar. You will see this in later Latin in Cicero in Latin 3. You will see it in Virgil in Latin 4. And again in Horace in Latin 4, if you take AP uh, Horace, Virgil, Catullus, you will see definitely the ablative of absolute being used. It's very, very popular. Okay, that's really all it is. A noun in the ablative case being described by a participle in the ablative case could be a present participle, a future participle, a past participle, and it describes circumstances surrounding the main clause. Describes circumstances surrounding the main clause. There you are. Okay? That's in a nutshell what the ablative of absolute is all about. So that's chapter 37. I'm looking at chapter 38 where it says the future participle. We've been through the participles, but just to make sure that you are aware of, of the nature of the participles, let me just erase this again and just do a quick review. We have three participles in Latin. We have a present participle. We have a past participle. And we have a future participle. The present participle we learned earlier in January. The present participle is simply the present stem of the verb. Let's again, let's take our friend Amo Amari, and we add, we take the present stem AMA and add NS, and we've got a third declension adjective, more or less. And then it's declined amans, amantis, amanti, right down to the third declension. And this NS and NT is the hallmark of the present participle. In English, it would be any ING word. Loving, the loving mother, the caring brother, okay? The loving mother, amans mater. The past participle is simply the fourth principal part of the verb. Fourth principal part, so you can find that anywhere. And make it end in US, A, and UM. That is, make it a first and second declension adjective. The loved mother, amata, mater. First and second declension adjective. Now, the one they're introducing on this page, on page um, 143, or excuse me, not page 143, looking at the future participle here, that's on the bottom of page 141. I'm sorry. All you do to make the future participle is go to your fourth principal part, which would be a matus, take off the US, and put down U-R-U-S, amaturus. And again, this is going to be a first and second declension adjective. Amaturus a-um. The mother about to be loved, mater amatura. When the gladiators raised and saluted Caesar in the Colosseum, they said, nos qui morituri sunt. We about, uh, morituri sumus, excuse me, we about to die, salutamus te. We salute you. So, and we get the word future from that. There it is. You are from the uh, verb to be, futurus. Okay? So there's your present, past, and future participles. And of course, you need your participles for ablative absolutes, which you went over in the previous chapter. So that's the future participle, chapter 38. Chapter 39, indirect questions we went over, the subjunctive we went over, sequence of tenses we went over, uh, further uses of the ablative case on page 146. Uh, these are uses that you generally see, but again, if you can recognize the ablative as an ablative, uh, the, the label may not be that important. Okay? Then, uh, indirect statement we went over in chapter 41. Um, chapter 42, um, gone over that. It says that no, it introduces no new grammar. Chapter 43, result clauses. We went over result clauses with the subjunctive. Conditional clauses we went over uh, in chapter 44 with the, our, our lesson on the subjunctive. Um, we went over uses of subjunctive and main clauses in chapter 45. And chapter 46 is a review chapter. And in chapter 47, the uses of cum and dum, we went over 
very uh, quickly uh, in our subjunctive lesson. So there you are, folks. Uh, that finishes up right to uh, chapter 47, what we have to do in Latin II this year. Thank you very much. Multus gratias, wobis discipuli.